Well, greetings and welcome to our Bible study, Isaiah. This is Lesson 12. In our previous few chapters here, we have been looking at the judgment that has come against the nations. And so we have seen, like in chapter 23 last week, the uh, judgment against Tyre. And you remember Tyre. Tyre is the uh, water port kingdom, and uh, King Hiram is the, the king of that. And so we see in chapter 23 the prophecy of Tyre, uh, or the prophecy against Tyre. And then in chapter 24, the prophecy kind of expands outward. And uh, in verse 24, one says, look, the Lord is going to lay waste to the earth. And uh, so what's been happening, what we've been talking about with Assyria, what's happened with Syria, Assyria going down and then Jerusalem going down and the prophecy, then Babylon going down. We've been saying that we certainly are talking about the generation of those things that are happening in Isaiah's time, but sometimes it's a foreshadowing as well. And here I think it's a foreshadowing of the end times, so the big going down or the end times event. And so I want to read that here. The Lord is going to lay waste to the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for the priest as for the people, for master as for servant, for maid as for maiden, for seller, for buyer, for borrower, for lender, for debtor, for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken. And do we see this happen, this end times event that I think is being foreshadowed? We absolutely do. We see it in the book of Revelation. And so if you have your Bible with you, maybe we'll flip over into Revel Revelation chapter 6. But on your way to Revelation chapter 6, I want to stop by Second Peter chapter 3 and, and uh, just uh, let me highlight a, a few things here. In Second Peter, it's around 68 AD. It's the final year of the persecution of the church under the emperor Nero. Both Paul and Peter have been caught up in the net uh, of, of this persecution. They both have been arrested. They've been tried. They've been convicted and sentenced to death. Peter is sitting on death row at this time in, um, in prison. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter had a, he'd always thought that he would uh, see the return of Christ. Everyone in the first generation of the church did. And Peter thought uh, he would see it, but apparently now that he, he knows he's uh, going to die, he's been sentenced to death, uh, his thoughts are obviously changing. And, uh, and maybe he's, he was asking, why is this taking so long? And it, and it occurs to him in chapter 3, uh, verse 8, and Peter, Peter says this, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is like a day. And basically, Paul's saying, you know, I've been thinking about uh, my time frame. Uh, I've been thinking about Christ's return in my time frame and, and, uh, and what I think is going to happen. And I've not looked at Christ's return in, in God's timing. Um, but it, 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 he's basically saying, if, if you're going to look at um, Jesus, we need to look at it in, in times framing. And God, um, you, you, if, when God looks behind, he sees eternity. When God looks ahead, uh, he sees eternity. And so a thousand years is like a blink of an eye to God is what Peter is saying. So uh, basically Peter is, is writing and saying, I, I was seeing, I wasn't seeing Christ's return in the right perspective. And, um, and so he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. No, he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is patient with us. However, the day of the Lord, uh, patient with us, however, the day of the Lord, and, and this is the end times event, will come and they will come like a thief in the night. And so this is what he's saying, this this great and terrible day as our, our Bible talks about this uh, that the day of the Lord is coming it's going to come it may not come the way I think it should come uh, but um, uh, let's look at it in God's perspective and realize it is going to come and what will happen in um, what will happen at that time um, as, as this great and, and terrible day approaches 
Well, uh, Peter tells us, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And uh, he's basically saying, and there is the conclusion of the sad, sorry story of humanity at the close of the age. Uh, just everything is laid waste. In Revelation chapter 5, uh, you see the beginning of this happening, uh, the preliminaries of the end times event. Uh, in Revelation chapter 5, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. And we see this scroll rolled up uh, and sealed by Daniel at the end of the book of Daniel. Now here's the scroll and Daniel is, is told, Daniel, uh, uh, look at this scroll. And so he's looked at the scroll and what he sees is that end times event described in it. And to Daniel, uh, we'll see this in Daniel chapter 10 if you're interested, he is so aghast at, at what he sees that he staggers and he collapses. He can't eat for three weeks. He can't drink anything. He's, uh, I would say, catatonic for three weeks after reading about the end times that, that um, is in the future of humanity. He's, so, he's catatonic at the horror of what he's seeing. At the end of uh, Daniel chapter 12, the Lord tells Daniel to roll up the scroll and seal it until the time of the end. And that's basically how Daniel ends uh, but, uh, with, a, with rolling up the scroll and the sealing of it until the end of the times. Well, now here in Revelation, we are at the end times. In Revelation chapter 5, we'll begin here instead of um, 6. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And the scroll that Daniel sealed up at the end of Daniel is kept until this time, this end times. Uh, reading on in Revelations. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. And I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And this is the title deed for the earth. And, and John is seeing salvation just kind of go away in, in the, the realization that the title to earth, the title to him is gone. Um, and it's kind of, a, I guess we'll say as, he's, uh, as we're seeing this, it's kind of like a dream. Um, 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 Daniel, as he, he's seeing these things happen, it's almost like he's in a nightmare and, and he's weeping uncontrollably and he doesn't know why. It's, it's, it's way beyond, in a sense, a, a normal reaction. John, uh, and John, in a, uh, uh, excuse me, I said Daniel, I meant John. Uh, John is, 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 uh, is just weeping and weeping is, is the, the way that the, the original text uh, talks about this. John is weeping because no one's found worthy to open the scroll, this title deed. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and its seven seals. And then we begin to see a scene of all creation glorify Christ um, because he'll open up the scroll. So in chapter 6, where I want us to be here today, uh, let's start at verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and when he did, I heard one of the four living creatures, which is this huge, magnificent, fearsome creature that uh, we see uh, beginning in, in uh, Revelation chapter 4, uh, but actually we've already seen this creature in Ezekiel chapter 1, so there's nothing new about these creatures. They, they, they were in Ezekiel, and, and I've said it several times, if we know the, the uh, the 65 books before Revelation, we can understand fairly easily what's going on in, in Revelation. And so we, we see these creatures that we have witnessed before uh, from Ezekiel. Let's move on here in Revelation chapter 6. I heard, the one, I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a white horse, its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its, its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other 
To him was given a large sword, and the lamb opened the third seal, and I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand, and then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying in this tiny little voice, A quart of wheat for a day's wage, three quarts of barley for a day's wage, and do not damage the oil or the wine. That's kind of funny. It's just talking about, I would say, the collapse of an economic system and the prices going skyrocketing. But uh, basically, God's saying when the end times comes, uh, these uh, there's just food is out of control. But don't mess with the, the booze and the, al- uh, the drugs. Um, let them go at it. They have been. Just let them have it. And the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say come and I looked and therefore before he was a uh, before him was a pale horse its rider was death and Hades was following close behind they were given power over one fourth of the, of the earth to kill by sword famine plague and wild beast and then he opened the fifth seal and I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and they these are the ones who were saying when will there be justice um, uh, Lord, well, let's move on here in six, uh, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and with that there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of hair. The whole earth, moon was turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell on the earth. And we're just beginning. This will, will go on all the way through chapter 18. The four living creatures announced the unleashing of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white horse brings an enforcement, and that, let's underline that, an enforcement of peace on the world. Then the fiery red horse is let loose, and that breaks the peace. Following, uh, war, uh, following that war comes, a black horse comes after that, a famine, and following the black horse comes the pale horse of death, sword, famine, plague, and, and wild beast. And we see uh, that in Revelation in, in a really dramatic scene. But it's not the first instance of seeing this picture. The Old Testament has this picture as well. The first time I think we see this is in the prophet Joel. We've not gotten to him yet, but I, um, uh, I think this is the first time we see that great and terrible day talked about in, in the Old Testament. So the prophet Joel among the, the minor prophets is probably the earliest writing prophet that introduces this term, the day of the Lord, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, uh, which is uh, in prophecy, and it, and it becomes a very common term for prophets, uh, that nearly every prophet uh, uses it referring to this end times event, and they simply, the prophets begin to simply abbreviate it on that day. And so when you read through the Old Testament, um, when you run across the phrase on that day, just realize that's an abbreviation of what Joel is talking about, that great and terrible day, that end times event. So on that day. And everyone knows the, the context of that term as, uh, as uh, those who are familiar with scripture reading in the Old Testament time and especially in Isaiah as we move now into Isaiah chapter 24 and he talks about on that day. Uh, this this is a foreshadowing again uh, in chapter 24 of the end times the Lord is going to lay waste to the earth and devastate it he will ruin its face scattering its inhabitants it will be the same for priests as for people the master and servant mistresses and maidservants sellers buyers borrowers lenders debtors creditors the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered the Lord has spoken then verse 4, the earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers, the exalted of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse consumes the earth, its people must bear their guilt. Therefore earth's inhabitants are burned up, very few are left. And remember Peter uh, said the earth and everything in it would be laid bare. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in Isaiah 24 as well. Now Isaiah 24, 7. The new wine dries up the, the vine 
withers, all the merrymakers groan, the gaiety of the tambourines is still, the noise of the revelers has stopped, the joyful heart is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song, the beer is bitter to its drinkers, the ruined city lies desolate, the interest of every house is barred. Entrance of every house is barred. In the streets they cry out for wine, all joy turns to gloom, all gaiety has vanished from the earth, the city is left in ruins, its gates broken to pieces so it will be on the earth and among the nations as when an olive tree is beaten or as when gleanings are left after the vintage is done. And 24, 14, they raise their voices, they shout for joy from the west, they claim the Lord's majesty when all this happened. Uh, um, what are we to say? Just what, what's here? How do we as God's people gathered to the Lord, how do we respond? We raise our voices and shout for joy from the West. And we claim the Lord's majesty when all this happens. Well, we'll find out what, um, again, what we say in Revelation, uh, because there's a response to that in, in Revelation as well. All those who are in the kingdom are praising God for his justice and what he has done here at the end. The whole story will, will come full circle so in that day, there, there's a, a catastrophic devastation, uh, this end times event. And in that day, there will be a, a, um, a great song of, of praise in response to, to God bringing his whole plan of salvation to its final conclusion. And um, so what are the results? What, what are the final conclusions? Well, let's uh, go back to uh, Revelation now to chapter 21. And we'll see the, the results, this final conclusion. Uh, I guess I'm, in a sense, giving, giving away the, the good stuff uh, after all the, the, the horrible devastation of, of judgment that comes, the wrath of God coming. But Revelation 21 says this, Now as I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, but had been laid bare, as Peter said. And also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And that's the end of our narrative story. Uh, the curtains went up in Genesis. The conflict ended. Our, uh, this conflict in Revelation ended our story from Genesis chapter 3 when sin entered the world and the entire rest of our narrative is is coming to terms with sin and uh, from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 21 uh, it's a story a narrative about coming to terms with dealing with uh, sin uh, that that has uh, tainted God's creation uh, the pivotal moment uh, in the, the plan of salvation was Christ nailed on the cross his death his burial his resurrection resurrection that enabled uh, uh, salvation to come to us uh, to his church and after that his church is born uh, this is what we're seeing in, in the Bible uh, this this plan of salvation so Jesus uh, again dies uh, hangs on the cross dead buried resurrected um, uh, pours out his Holy Spirit to save us after that his church is born moves out into the world uh, but when we get to the end and and there there is an end as we were told time and time again like in Isaiah, it's going to happen. Judgment is going to happen. Uh, as we come to the end, the curtain uh, comes down. Uh, in, in the Bible, time is, is linear. It has a beginning. It has a middle. It has an end. And when the curtain comes down, the conflict of sin has been resolved once and for all. Uh, the, the sad, uh, sorry story of humanity broken by sin is over on this earth. Uh, there is no earth. It is totally incinerated. It, it's gone and there's, there's a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, 
the first heaven, the, the first earth are gone, and and what is and, and what it is that that, that 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 what is this new heaven, this new earth that uh, Revelation chapter twenty one is is talking about here? Well, it's a place where uh, the dwelling of God is with men. Revelation twenty one uh, tells us He will live with us. We will live in the uh, in a living presence of God. There will be no more death, uh, or mourning, or crying, or pain. The old order of things is is over. Is is what is proclaimed to us in chapter twenty one. As again, as we began this story in Genesis chapter three to Revelation twenty one, a new order has begun. Uh, the Bible is telling a, a linear story from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And, and the important role the prophets play in setting up this event, uh, the events that, that are going to unfold in Revelations. Um, uh, notice how uh, many times the, the, the prophets, they come back, uh, right back to these stories of, of end times. It's kind of like a, uh, in, in some of their stories, I guess you'd say it's a, a circular telling. They come to the beginning, take you to the end, and then the next prophet does the same thing. Uh, it kind of takes you at the beginning, looks at the beginning, takes you all the way uh, to the end, uh, and and this and this new beginning of God uh, creating a, a new heavens and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21. The old uh, has gone, and there's a whole new era of life with God and the kingdom of, of God. Uh, so we we have this this terrific story here, and our prophet Isaiah. Uh, uh, I went into this detail about uh, about the end times event because uh, that's the story uh, we're heading to as we continue in Isaiah. He's he's taking us to this end time event and and proclaiming this new heaven and this new earth. Uh, he's proclaiming hope in the, in the Messiah to us. He, he's he's just laying out the story that. Uh, the prophet, as we've said before, always speaks in his own historical context. But sometimes there's a foreshadowing that that pivotal event in the plan of salvation, uh, the, the, the coming of the Messiah, sometimes there's a, there's a foreshadowing of end times events uh, uh, that culminates the, the plan of salvation that shows us the, the big picture. And we see this here in the first half of Isaiah. And we'll see it in, in many of the other prophets as well. Well, this brings um, us up uh, now in Isaiah as, as we've gone through the, the woes. Woe to Babylon, uh, to chapter 36, the, the judgment chapters. Uh, then chapters 36 through 39 uh, is prose. And if you remember your high school, prose is kind of a... It's like a, we're, we're taking a breath here because this has been all these judgments, all these woes from Assyria, Jerusalem, Babylon. Um, they're they're intense, and we well we got uh, Alexander the Great, um, the Greek culture as well as Roman uh, culture as well mentioned here. Just the the um, the uh, woes that that come to them, um, and, and at times God using them to bring judgment and, and to wake up Israel. Uh, but prose is kind of like a um, we, we've been in a very intense dramatic story and it's almost like a taking of the breath a stepping back and, and in a sense um, maybe a retelling of the stories too but not not in a very dramatic way it's kind of um, have you ever been to a movie that was so intense that after you got out of the movie Maybe you went with your um, your significant other or friends you went with, went to a coffee shop or a dinner, and you just kind of had to let your emotions out in the movie, and you had to talk about it and kind of make sense of it. Well, that's what's happening in, in chapters 36 through 39. It's kind of a taking a breath from this dramatic story and, um, and I guess trying to slow things down and, and understand the, the prophecy a little, a little bit better. So... In a sense, this is kind of an interlude because Isaiah is going to pick right back up after chapter 36. And I guess we can say it, it is going to get intense a, a bit more again for us. But we have a pause here in the next uh, few chapters, 36 through 39. All right, I'm going to stop here today. And I pray that you'll have a, a blessed week this week. I look forward to seeing you. Please come back Friday for our devotion around 10 a.m. 
And then, of course, Sunday we gather at the church if you're able. If not, uh, please join us again here on the Internet. Well, God bless. Peace of Christ be with you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.